sure I don't overrun, so I had to reset my timer there. Um, thanks uh, Michael and team for having me, and thanks all of you for coming out in this uh, terrible weather. I, I was considering not coming myself. It's not that bad. <laughs> so my name is Kars Alfrink. Uh, I am a principal at Hubbub. Um, and uh, uh, Hubbub is a, is a small consultancy and a small studio uh, based uh, here in Utrecht and in Berlin. Uh, and we do uh, playful design. So the consultancy part of Hubbub uh, helps organizations do things with games and with play. Um, and we offer services uh, uh, such as strategy, invention and prototyping mostly. The studio initiates its own projects, uh, games, toys, other playful products. These are often more experimental or critical, and they often combine uh, the digital and the physical. Uh, and so this is one example which uh, was just updated this morning, the 2.0 version. This is Standing. It's an app for playful activism inspired by the Standing Man demonstrations in Turkey. A while ago, it's an app that lets you stand still for a cause and share that with your social networks. Uh, so check that out. The Twitter account for this is at GetStanding, and you'll find the app through there. Uh, um, a project we're working on at, in the studio at the moment is Bycatch, which is a, a card game about drone warfare and drone surveillance, which has a neat uh, mechanic involving camera phones. Uh, we uh, kind of simulate drone surveillance by letting you take photos of hands of cards of your opponents. And these cards represent citizens in a country that you are spying on. And if you st try and make photos of hands of cards of other people, you'll, f you'll find out that a lot can go wrong with making those photos. They are unreliable. And so this is kind of a metaphor for some of the problems we see with uh, the, the kind of the contemporary way of hunting down bad guys globally. Um, this is due to be released in January. You can pre-order it uh, at uh, uh, bycat.ch. Um, so that's just the name of the game with a dot here. Um, and uh, you could say some. You might think. Well, this is an example of a serious game, which is a term I hope some of you are familiar with, or this is a game for change. Um, uh, I prefer to call it an issue game. Um, because I kind of dislike the idea of serious games, which is the, the idea, the concept serious game is often used to describe a, a category of games where the goal is uh, is a different, a different goal than primarily entertainment. Um, the problem I have with the concept of serious games is that this implies that there is a, a, a particular kind of game that is educational and all the other games aren't, which is nonsense, in my opinion. All games teach <coughs> something. Um, Another problem, and, and this is a problem that hampers the Games for Change movement also, is that often uh, such games are commissioned by institutions, and um, 
by, by nature of the way they are made and the way they are funded, uh, they can uh, hardly, they, can, they have a hard time changing the institutions that commission them, right? Because, uh, so they, 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 they typically serve institutional goals in some way. So um, bycatch is, uh, is, is neither of those. Uh, it's an issue game because it's simply a game that, uh, that simulates a problem uh, as a game, and that's it. So the problem is what you play, and what happens after, and why that is important is kind of uh, almost besides the point. So games are simulations of experiences, uh, and the the thing that kind of uh, the meaning that they convey is as much. Uh, conveyed by what they do simulate as what they leave out. Because what they leave out, you as a player need to kind of fill in yourself. And by filling in uh, this gap, uh, meaning is produced. So, and games are made of systems, right? So they are interactive, they are rule based, they, they simulate things. And now, why is it fun to play a game? Uh, because as you play it, you start to understand the system underneath the surface. And learning systems, kind of grokking patterns, is a very pleasurable thing to us humans. It's this kind of sense of competence that arises from this. Uh, here's uh, this guy. Is having a having a moment like that. This is the Street Fighter Four Championship that happened this year in Vegas at Evolution 2014, a global fighting game tournament. Uh, he's very good. <laughs> you can look up the match on YouTube. It's crazy. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, three ways games. Uh, teach things. And the first is about playing them. So this is a formal perspective. This is looking at games as things, as artifacts, as objects, as things that are made. And so, like I said, the way you learn things from games uh, from this perspective is by mastering their systems. So if we design, if we design things like this, we, the, the way we approach it is by taking the subject that we are trying to uh, teach something about, you could say, and translating that subject into things you can do. The fancy term game designers use for that, for things you can do, are game mechanics. Simply the things a player does in the game. Uh, this is a formal notation system for that called skill chains, it's not important, but these are all the things you can do in Tetris. These are all the core mechanics in Tetris and how they interrelate. So one of the interesting things about this perspective is that you, st you, you start by learning simple things and then you gradually kind of chain those together into more and more complex activities. It's an interesting way of looking at any interactive thing people use. So when we were designing a base to Bende, which is playable here in the uh, Utrecht University uh, Museum, uh, we used this perspective. So um, this is a game for families that they play while visiting the Cabinet of Curiosities in the museum. So it's for young people and older people. And it's a game about natural sciences and about how the natural sciences uh, categorizes animals. And so what we've done is uh, made this cabinet of curiosities part of the game. And it's kind of a tool in the game that you use as it was once used to do this exact thing, to categorize animals in, uh, in different groups. 
Because actually, the brief from the client was, make something about the scientific method. Teach something about the scientific method, which is about forming a, a, hypothesis, a hypothesis and uh, testing it and so on and so forth. So we boil that down into an activity, a game-based activity, which takes place in the cabinet of curiosities. So once again, this is a formal perspective. Right? So it's about games as designed artifacts. Uh, and, it, and it's fine to look at things like that, but it's just one way of looking at things. Um, another way to look at things, uh, which is just as important, maybe even more important, is play. Uh, and this is the play, the player perspective, the people who are actually playing the game. So what is play? Uh, uh, a popular definition by uh, two game scholars, Salen and Zimmerman, is that it is free movement within a more rigid system, which is a very kind of uh, abstract definition, but it's actually pretty accurate, I think. Um, when we play, we kind of explore the, the kind of the free space we have to do our thing, whatever that thing may be. And it's an act of kind of asserting our humanity or our individuality. Um, in the workplace, play happens often through workplace pranks. Mm -hmm. uh, what is, I mean, the stapler in Jello is a great example of uh, people asserting their humanity in inhumane uh, conditions, in kind of finding some free space within a rigid system, in this case a terrible, terrible uh, paper company. Um, so from the perspective of play, <clears throat> all of a sudden individual people start to matter, right? Because from the perspective of a game, we don't really care who's playing it. It's about how well crafted the game itself is. And now all of a sudden, who you are, what your background is, uh, what your perspective on life is, matters a lot. Uh, because players complete the work <clears throat> that game designers start. Uh, so, uh, one way, some, some people claim, and I agree, uh, that uh, players should, should therefore be able to adapt the game, any game, to their needs in some way. This is also the perspective of uh, the player community, so we're not just talking about individual players, we're also talking about people coming together around experiences of play, and there even, it's even more important that whatever they uh, play can be adapted to their needs, because every group is different. Uh, so if a game allows for this, a community can form around, around it. So from the player perspective, learning only starts to happen when you, are, when you start changing the game. When you, when you do the proverbial stapler in jello, when unexpected things start to happen, when uh, kind of the individual uh, nature of the persons playing uh, uh, are expressed. Okay, so how do we do this? Uh, uh, elsewhere, I've talked about uh, under-specification. So as a designer, not being too uh, precise in what a player can and cannot do. It's kind of fighting the urge to control uh, the people using whatever you're designing. Uh, more recently, I've started using the term flux dogma, which has just this awesome ring to it. It kind of sounds like magic. Uh, which was coined by David Kanega, who's a brilliant guy, uh, musician and game designer and uh, theorist. Um, Flux Dogma uh, is about, well, as it says here, in a system, anything that is a constant, that is fixed, turn it into a variable which is under control of, of the people using it. Um, so it's kind of this flexibility thinking in terms of instruments that you can play, like a musical instrument, more than a machine that has only one fu function. Um, so, when it comes to adjusting 
two group needs based on that does this really well. Uh, the way we did this is that some of the rules of the game are socially negotiated, like in a board game or in a, in a party game or in a social game. So <clears throat> some of the, uh, the, the, the system, the app that is used suggests certain rules, but they are not baked into the software. You might think so at first, but you'll, if you play for a while, you'll discover that you can basically circumvent them if you feel like cheating, or if you just uh, think things are too hard, or you want to give uh, some, uh, uh, your opponent a break, it allows for this, which is really nice and, and super important if you're designing for families, uh, visiting museums, because the, the, they, they're so, such a diverse group. Um, the flux dogma thing, the underspecification thing, uh, we tried to uh, we tried to do in Camp Park. Uh, these are huge camera balls, transparent balls with a camera, a panoramic camera in it that stream live video to the internet. Um, this, this is footage from the first time we ran it at uh, Stabes in Eindhoven. It's kind of a toy, right? It's not a, a game per se, although you know, let's not get to get into definitions there. Uh, but we, we try to kind of make this a very, we try to make this a, a, a thing where everything is variable and under people's <coughs> control and therefore it affords all kinds of different games that you can play with them. These are like huge public space toys, basically. And uh, the footage is also. So yeah, some examples of what you can do. You'll see some familiar faces who are in the room here also. You can be jealous of them because they got to play. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's the player perspective. Now I have uh, one final perspective to talk about. Okay, so many people find games interesting because they use computers and uh, because computers are really good at counting stuff. Uh, and so if we use games, so the interest uh, in, in games for change or using games for certain, certain goals such as education often comes from this notion that because they use computers they can kind of tell you in numbers uh, what, uh, what the changes that they that they uh, brought about. Um, but not all the things that are worth changing can be counted. I'm, I'm sure you agree with me there. Uh, and anyway, I've found over the years doing this kind of work that it's probably impossible to conclusively prove their usefulness uh, through quantification anyway. Uh, so I think it's a dead end, basically which is kind of an interesting thing to say since I'm in the business of making these things. <laughs> um, but but there's, a, there's, there's a value in doing it uh, myself. It's probably the, the most important reason why I got into it in the first place, is making these things is a way to think through topics that I find interesting. Uh, for example, you know, now we're working on a card game about drones. I've been working on it for the past year. By making a game about that subject, I've, I've had to really kind of immerse myself in, this, in the topic. And by translating that into something that people can play, something really interesting happens because you, you take this system perspective and you need to kind of craft something that kind of reflects your understanding of it as a system. Uh, I really uh, enjoy doing that and it also often I come out somehow different every time I go through that process. So it's transformative in a way. So this is why I enjoy getting other people hooked on designing games, making games uh, so much. And, and this is as something that we've been doing more and more of uh, at Hubbub, is running workshops that are about uh, playful design, game design, in a way that is accessible to a broad range of people. So it's not about becoming an expert video game designer, but it is about 
uh, becoming kind of comfortable with thinking like a game designer about problems. So this is a shot from a, one workshop that we run, it's called Playing with Rules, uh, where the assignment is to take the, the very crappy board game Parcheesi, mens ergje niet in Dutch, um, and uh, change rules so that it uh, conveys something about a topic that you as a group choose. And you go through uh, the iterative design process, which is typical of game design. You start prototyping, playing, testing, reflecting, and so on and so forth. And in my opinion, these skills allow you to get better at learning in general. So it's kind of a meta skill in that way. Making games, crafting systems, allows you to kind of uh, then go to many different subjects of study and apply those meta skills to learning specific subjects. So game design is iterative design. It's, it's crafting complex systems that are unpredictable uh, when they are being inhabited by players. Like I said, right? Players, people, are individuals, are unique, are different. They always surprise you. Uh, and this sounds to me an awful lot like many of the challenges that uh, we are faced with and that we are probably uh, asked to uh, solve in some way as creative professionals. I'm sure many of you are uh, involved in projects about uh, all kinds of subjects that are about these kind of wicked problems, complex systems, unpredictability, risk, and so on. And so game design is a very useful perspective and a very useful skill for, uh, for, for kind of approaching these, these problems. So that's the, uh, so making games is useful too. So that's kind of the final perspective, that's the uh, designer's perspective. And like I said, we do this through uh, getting people involved with making things. Uh, here's another photo from a workshop we, run, we ran recently about uh, playful products, smart, uh, smart devices, smart products, and, and imagining them as people, as characters. And, uh, and kind of acting out these characters. So they're, they're very spontaneous. It's like, it's like a cross between um, physical prototyping and improv theater. It's kind of the two things that we mash together in, in this workshop, which is, again, a playful way of, of approaching things. So, uh, by playing games, we learn systems. By changing games, we challenge systems, and by uh, making games, we craft systems. Uh, and the ways in which we do this that I showed you, each of these can be used in non-game projects as well. Right? So, thinking in terms of activities. Allowing for degrees of freedom and inviting people to design with you. Thank you very much. Thank you.